the ones that fared better were ones that had women on boards, suggesting that female board members might have been better at defensive and delivering results in bad times. So if you can deliver in the good times and be 25% better by just adding a one diverse seat on your board, think about what it could be when you add more than that, as well as what happens when things go wrong. A diverse board helps you think about all the angles through multiple lenses. And so it's a big passion of mine to make sure we get greater representation on public boards. It has been well established that companies with more ethnic, cultural, and gender diversity are more innovative and profitable than those without. Being intentional about diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy simply makes good business sense. But how do you do that? What strategies actually work? This podcast tells the stories of visionaries who are actually changing the diversity landscape of tech and explores the strategies they're using to become more diverse by design. This is Nia Darvill, your host, and you're listening to the Diverse by Design podcast. All right, everyone. Today, I have Michelle McKenna, CIO of the National Football League here with us. Thank you for being here, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Yes. So this is going to be a great conversation. First, let's start off with you just telling me a little bit about yourself. So tell me about yourself and what your journey to tech has been. My story is a long and winding road. This season is my 10th season at the National Football League as the head of the league's technology activities and CIO. Mm -hmm. It was uh, certainly not planned uh, exactly how I got here from a small town in Alabama to my current office on Park Avenue in New York City. It's certainly been a long way. But along the way of my 30-year career, I've been a CPA, an analyst, a controller. I'm a public board member and a CIO. I'm also a mom, a mom to two kids who are grown-ups now. My son, Jackie, is 25 and my daughter, Maggie, is 23. And as I work through my whole life and looking back over my journey into tech, My shift came in 1999 at Disney. I moved into tech and it was because a leader at the time of parks and resorts was looking for someone to lead a big technological transformation. And he was looking for someone different, someone that hadn't perhaps been in the technology department uh, all along, sort of a a fresh approach, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I moved on uh, to and left Disney and became the CIO of a energy company. Uh, And when I think back to that interview, that CEO, I remember saying to him, I don't have any experience in energy and exactly why are you wanting to hire me? (laughs) Which is, I think, so typical of women who, you know, you Mm -hmm. sort of like need to prove why you're there. And his answer to me was, I know a lot of people in this building who know energy, but no one has your background. And I really want your background because it's different. And I want a female uh, leader in our senior ranks. Mm-hmm. And now on to the NFL as the first CIO and at the time, the only female senior executive in the league office. And when I joined the board of Ring Central uh, in 2015, I was also the only female on the board of directors. And so in all of these examples, Disney, Constellation, the NFL, and Ring Central, it came about because someone uh, had to take a chance on someone that was non-traditional candidate and mm-hmm. look outside their typical area for talent. And that's kind of how my long and windy road from a degree in accounting and a master's degree in business ended up with me leading technology for one of the largest brands uh, in America. Wow. Wow. Okay. So I have several follow-up questions. That's such an incredible story. And thank you for sharing it with us. My first is that you mentioned being a part of a corporate board for Ring Central. So can you t- tell me a little bit more about that? I know diversity in boards is a huge topic right now. So just give me, what are your thoughts on um, board leadership, especially when it comes to diversity? Well, the the role of a board of directors is to represent the shareholders and drive the best results of the business for shareholders. So 
it only stands to reason that a good diverse board would make business sense. Um, but there's also been a lot of research done on the topic. And I've been chair of nominating and governance committees for public boards. And when you do a little research, you realize that it's not just the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do mm -hmm. uh, to make sure you have diversity uh, on your on your board. Uh, Forbes published, it's something anyone can look up, a study um, from years ago that looked across many, many uh, companies over a span of six years and looked at what their success rates were, both from a uh, corporate responsibility perspective, as well as profitability. And boards with women, um, particularly this study was about women on boards, outperformed male-only boards um, by 26%. And wow. if you told any shareholder you could bump them 25% by doing one thing, you can bet they'd be lined up to do it. Right. And so just the numbers prove out. But one thing I found even more interesting, and I think this plays to the strengths of women, is uh, out of the financial crisis following 2008 and 2009, looking back at financial institutions that came out of that and grew again, the ones that fared better were ones that had women on boards, suggesting mm -hmm. that female board members might have been better at defensive and delivering results in bad times. So mm -hmm. if you can deliver in the good times and be 25% better by just adding a, one diverse seat on your board, think about what it could be when you add more than that, as well as what happens when things go wrong. A diverse board helps you think about all the angles through multiple lenses. And so it's a big passion of mine to make sure we get greater representation on public boards. Wow, that is incredible. A 25% uh, increase. And that's a lot of money. <laughs> you know? lot of money. And being diverse and inclusive, like you said, just makes good business sense. So to shift the conversation a little bit, the two worlds you're currently thriving in, both technology and football, are typically male-dominated spaces. What has your experience been navigating your career as a woman? Technology, for sure, has been a male-dominated field um, for many, many, many years. Math and science tends to be more male-dominated. If you look at people graduating with math and science degrees, from colleges, we do see greater parity across gender in those that graduate, but what we don't see is them staying with it as long. So there is an issue that has to get addressed as to sort of why um, technology roles aren't geared uh, for women to be successful. For me, I have found that to be successful in both football and technology is asking for help when you need it and looking for uh, mentors and people that can guide you during times when you're uncertain. And one thing that I think any field, whether it be tech or certainly in football, people just want to win and they want to put the best team on the field and they want to see results. So if you can take away gender stereotypes and just be open to a different way of getting there, if the results are just as good, do you have to have followed the same path as everyone mm -hmm. else? And I think if you can answer the question there, you get to the point where for me in my career, I did not have a background in technology. I didn't have an engineering degree, but I had a great curiosity about how things worked. Mm -hmm. I worked very hard to deliver results and I expressed a big interest in technology and by doing all of those things, I was able to find mentors, most of them male, um, who helped me and who gave me opportunities. And, you know, you laugh about it. My mom used to always tell me when I first got married, remember, he can't read your mind. You have to tell him what you need. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that might be good relationship advice, but it's definitely good career advice, too, is just mm -hmm. not assuming that people can read your mind. And so that's how I got into technology and football. Much the same way, I wanted to play football as a little girl. I was not allowed to play football as a little girl uh, where I grew up and in my age group, but I stayed really close to the love of the game and have been a part of the game my whole life. So I also, if you can't work in something that you're passionate about, you can still immerse yourself in it in ways mm -hmm. that 
at the end of the day, if you develop the right expertise and you're given the opportunity, it really won't matter uh, your gender or your ethnic or other background. Mm. Gotcha. So, so like you said, it's getting that opportunity. How can organizations be intentional about giving the opportunity um, to people that don't necessarily look like them? I think you have to make it a mandate that you're going to have a diverse slate. And if you don't do that, you're missing out on some of the best talent you could ever find. And it does need to be talked about a lot. We need like your podcast here. We need to have it as a topic of conversation and talk about it in an open way. No one is saying diversity for diversity's sake. No one's saying you have to hire someone of a certain background. All anyone is saying is that you want to be given the same opportunities. And that means you might have to work a little harder to give Mm -hmm. others the opportunity. And I owe my job at the NFL to um, a person who's no longer at the NFL. His name is Rory. He was a recruiter. Um, He wanted to make sure there was a diverse slate for what at the time was posted as a VP of IT infrastructure. Mm. I found the job online and went to apply and sort of bothered him every day until he met me for coffee and I got the interview. And I'm pretty sure the only reason I got the interview because I had no background and in sports, uh, I did not have, you know, a, a knowledge of people that worked in the NFL. I didn't come from a club was that he was really focused on putting forth a diverse slate. And mm-hmm. so I went in and not only did I get the job, I pitched it to be a higher level job as a CIO and a senior VP because that was the level that I was at and mm. and that I needed to be able to hire and grow the team. That came about because not only did the organization want to present a diverse slate, but because an individual made it their personal commitment to not move forward unless they had put forth a diverse slate. So yeah. I think that's what we all have to do. And it's our responsibility to do it. Um, and in yeah. in life and in all of our open positions and also just in advocating for others, Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have an open position, just keeping a diverse network is is Mm -hmm. good um, because you never know when the opportunities are going to present. Right. That's powerful. That's powerful. Now, there's something else you said in there. Um, You talked about not only did you have the opportunity for the interview, but after he advocated for you to actually put forth that diverse slate, you advocated for yourself in order to convert that position into a higher position. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What was that like? I know that's something a lot of women struggle with advocating for themselves and really knowing their worth and, and expressing their worth to people in authority. So you can, can you talk a little bit more about that process? That's a great question. And to boil it down, what it really entailed was someone opening the door and just knowing that I had one sponsor in my corner that believed I needed to be there. And I mm-hmm. think that women need that more than men. You need mm-hmm. to know going in that someone has your back. Someone is advocating for you. And if you can mm-hmm. find who that person is and get to know them before the big interview or before the big meeting or wherever it is before you need to make the ask that you're uncomfortable asking, if you spend a little bit of time with that person who believes in you to just remind you that you do deserve it and you do Mm -hmm. have a voice and that you should use it. That's sort of what I did when I went into the interview for this job. It was a new role because they'd never had a CIO. So They were replacing uh, someone that had left that was a head of infrastructure. But I made a business case and I felt very comfortable because I knew the subject matter and I really knew football well. And so I prepared, I built a uh, presentation that was how I would sort of sell the strategy forward within the organization, how I would teach the league, what a CIO was and how it could be used. And I had a lot of really specific examples of things that I think we could do right away based on what Mm -hmm. I had done. So I did my research. I was prepared and I was ready. But sitting in the boardroom uh, on Park Avenue of that beautiful building in a place I had always dreamed of even just visiting, it was quite intimidating. And Mm -hmm. I remember just 
bowing my head, saying a quick little prayer, just don't let me screw this up and Mm -hmm. just be yourself as much as possible. And it went really well. And after a couple of interviews and rounds, I got called back with more questions. And I think someone asked me for a copy of the presentation. And I remember sitting there thinking, okay, I guess I'll just email it to them. But I said, I'll give it to you when you hire me. And and they mm-hmm. still remember that. Like the head of HR still remembers me saying that. And then I went out, I called my husband right away. I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was such a smart ass. I said, <laughs> you can have it when you hire me. And then I thought, why would I think that that was, you know, yes. you guys do this kind of stuff all the time. Right. So it is, you have to just dig deep and be ready. So get your best cheerleaders around you before you go into a big uh, confrontational or even something that you're unsure about mm-hmm. and then just stick to it. Wow. I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> it. So you mentioned in your intro that in addition to being a powerhouse executive, you're a mom. Have you balanced that incredible job with your career? Perhaps the, not perhaps, the most um, proud moments of my life have been around my children. And if you were to interview the two of them now as young adults, they'd say that that mom has always had a crazy schedule and mom has always <laughs> been running around and mom wasn't always there to pick us up after school. And sometimes I missed basketball games and things, but they were sort of both bought in into my career. I had mm. a very supportive family system around me and I did have a very supportive employer. I worked for Disney at the time. My son, he's 25, was born. And they had a very liberal um, maternity leave. Uh, Not only did you get what was medically required, but you had, uh, you could save up vacation days. Ultimately, I ended up being able to be with him until he was six months old. Wow. And that is, and my, they held my job, which just doesn't happen. So I think more and more companies are realizing how important it is to have you know, top women uh, in the field and women who want to be mothers. And so I didn't do everything right for sure, but I did the best I could. And then I was back to work part-time. They also allowed me to shift back part-time because I couldn't, I really couldn't bring myself to leave him. And that they worked out a work arrangement where I could work part-time and then I got pregnant again. And so, um, (laughs) They're 18 months apart. And I think it also helped that they a little bit raised each other. And Mm -hmm. my parents were a big part and their dad was a very active hands-on dad. So a mom to have a career, women often ask me, um, how do you have it all? And the answer is you can't. You can't ever have it all at one time. You Mm -hmm. can have it all over your lifetime. But there will be times when your career takes a backseat. There'll be times when being a mom takes a backseat. And unfortunately, I'm divorced, uh, remarried, but divorced. And there are times when your relationship with your partner takes a backseat. Mm. And it's balancing all those things through life um, that you just have to listen to your inner voice and know when you might be doubling down too much on one or the other and try your Mm. best to... Uh, balance it back out. So um, that's, you know, it's a, it's something I talk to young women about all the time. And I think one of the hardest things to do is balance it all. Mm -hmm. But, but such powerful advice, listen to that inner voice. You're not going to be able to handle everything at the same time, but you can have it all over your lifetime. And that's, that's where, where you have to hone in. Um, And as a young woman listening to your advice, I really appreciate that. So to shift a little bit more, um, you work for an organization that has had a very public diversity and inclusion journey, the NFL. Can you tell us a little bit about your role in that journey? Well, as a leader at the NFL, we've always had what we do be in the public eye. And that took a little bit of getting used to for me is just knowing that what I say and do has a, a public facing impact But most importantly, it has an impact on the people that work for me and with me and close to me. And so what I've tried to do through our journey as we've 
had the events of the last few years unfold in front of us is to just be there and be a listener and give a safe space for people to talk about things that heretofore were not talked about. And um, my role is to just make sure that my team knows that I listen and I can't always fix, but I will make sure you're heard. And I think from what I've heard from so many people is that's often the biggest thing is I just want to be seen and I want to be heard and I want you to try to understand. So my goal has been to make sure I always see and hear and then I strive to understand. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it is very public um, after the killing of George Floyd and what unfolded in front of the world on those days. We were in the middle of a global pandemic. My team was all distributed across Um, And we had a quick Zoom call to get everyone on. I I didn't know what to do or say. We didn't have a handbook for how to handle things like this. Um, So we just sort of led from our hearts. And we had a couple hundred people on a Zoom. And I was empathetic and hurting, but I could not have put into words at all what I heard back from team members that had experienced the things they had experienced in their lives. And so I try to just bring those forums together so that we can tell our stories. And one young man told a story that I'll retell now because it's, it's very powerful. And we were talking about how we show up for work and Mm -hmm. he's a black man and he often sets up our big events at fancy hotels. So Four Seasons and, you know, Mm -hmm. Breakers in Palm Beach and things like that. He works on my team and makes sure all of the event runs smoothly. And he's always so nicely dressed. And we, someone made a comment at some point about how he's always the best dressed man at the meeting. And he very, and with quite vulnerability said, do you know why I'm the best dressed man at the meeting? Mm. And, you know, we're all sitting there like, no, why? And he said, well, mm. and to another one of our coworkers, who's a white man, he said, if you show up with a hoodie uh, and your suitcase, no one is going to think twice walking into the breakers in Palm Beach. Mm. But if I show up with that, it's different. So I wear a suit just to be sure. Mm. And that was so powerful, just that one story. And that was a little tiny story that it opened up this big, then a lot of people just started sharing, oh, this happened and this happened. So I think it's our responsibility to just represent our employees. I might not look like you, sound like you, or have the same life experience as you, but I owe it to you to know you and try my best to represent uh, forward. And that's what I try to do with the league and what I think many of us who are in these positions of, um, you know, ability to make a difference are trying to do. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, My last and final question is this. The NFL has a very diverse fan base. How do you maintain a commitment to pursuing progressive diversity benchmarks at a time when commitments to diversity can be viewed as a politicized act? It comes down to business. It's Mm -hmm. we could totally depoliticize this in two seconds. Just do the math. Um, Our fan base is very diverse. Uh, multi-ethnic backgrounds, multi-languages, female, male. It, it, it's its so diverse that it absolutely would make no sense to not be diverse in our approach to business and our marketing and in our products and what we do. So we just stick to doing what we do, which is deliver the best game, deliver the best product for our fans and our workforce. And what we do should reflect our fan base and our business. And Mm. it's really that simple. I know it's politicized um, and it's unfortunate that it is um, because it really is just business. And one of the things I look forward to is, again, my kids being 22 and 25, when I hear them talk about this, it it's not political at all. They, they just don't think the same way and we don't have to have the same debates. So I'm just so hopeful that this next generation 
of workforce that we won't still be talking about the fact that the first female this and the first female that and the first black this and the first Hispanic that one day it'll just be, you know, this person mm-hmm. did this. And mm-hmm. I think we can all dream that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here with us today, Michelle. Do you have anything that you'd like to say before we finish? No, just thanks for having me. And thanks for doing these things because it's sort of hard to get this message out in a real and authentic way versus a training course or something. Mm -hmm. So getting more and more people to talk about it and making it everyone's responsibility is how we'll change it. So thanks for giving me the chance. Thank you. Thanks for joining me as we discuss diversity in tech with Michelle McKenna, the CIO of the NFL. Diverse by Design is powered by Perscolas and the IT Senior Management Forum. To learn more about how we can help your organization become more diverse by design, visit our website at diversebydesign.org. Before we let you go, we want to thank our sponsors, Tech Systems, J.P. Morgan Chase, Google, Chubb, and Comcast NBC Universal for their support. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss any insights about how you can make your organization diverse by design. Until next time.